All right, we have $10 from Anonymous. I don't know what to write, so here's a bad punny joke. What do you call a bat in a belfry? A dingbat. We have $10 from Paul D. I don't have much money, but here's $10 in aid of my mother, Enza Danino. She passed away over the Christmas due to cancer. And shout out to my dad, Michael Danino, for being awesome through this ordeal. We have $30 from Harrison. Hey, Harrison here. Loving AGDQ as always. Had to donate during my favorite two Castlevania games. One of my friends lost his grandfather to lung cancer unexpectedly, so I know how terrible, terrible of a thing it is. Money goes to seeing Metroid run with a suitless Samus. And I believe we are ready for the interview with Dragon Blitz and uh, Black Youth. Hey, thank you so much, Dragon Blitz. Awesome, awesome run. Uh, I cannot believe that. They're, with a run that glitch heavy, I would be so freaked out that anything could go wrong at any yeah. time, but you really kept your composure the entire time and really pulled it all the way through. Nice yeah. job. There's, I've died to almost every enemy. I've seen every single way to soft lock, every way to crash the game. So after a while, it just is, it becomes numb. You know, yeah. you, just, you know it can happen, but you just hope it doesn't. Yeah. In my mind, it's really, in these glitch heavy runs, a lot of it is about really opening strong, hitting those first couple glitches. So when you hit that shift line into the elevator so, so well and so quickly, mm -hmm. Um, did you feel like that was at all kind of a relief and that you kind of... Oh, yeah. That, that is probably my favorite trick in the whole run. Yeah. That was the opening trick that made me want to learn the run in the first place. I thought it was so interesting how you could, like... Um, back then, we thought there was possibly a time save in any percent to use that trick to skip having to fight Slugger and Gaibon. Turns out it's a slight bit slower, but uh -huh. it's still interesting to, like, know yeah. how to do. So that was kind of the opening to me learning the category. Nice. Uh, what would you say are the scariest parts of the run? Definitely the doppelganger skip. There's like a huge section where there's no saves, where you have to hit mm. like a frame perfect trick with a setup um, so you're on the right pixel. And then right afterwards, if you screw up the timing on a big toss, you're just, the run's over. So for marathon settings, that's kind of scary. Um, yeah, because at home, I mean, you're able to just, oh, that yeah, happened, reset. reset. Yeah. But marathon setting, how do you kind of compose yourself mentally for just being ready for that? Lots of practice, lots of just like, I've had so many practice runs here that kind of were like, they went really sour really fast and mm. I knew that there was a possibility it was gonna happen. Um, that's why the estimate was like 10 minutes higher than my PB or something like that, just to give myself that wiggle room. I knew like, worst case scenario, I finished the run and it's, I'm not happy with it, but like I still got to show off everything that the run has to you know offer. So I wasn't too worried about it. Yeah. Like it could have been a disaster, but it wasn't. So that's good. <laughs> How long have you been playing Symphony of the Night? Oh, geez, since uh, I've been playing since I was a kid. Uh, honestly, it's my favorite game of all time. But speedrunning wise, um, I picked it up as a serious speedrun back in like 2013, something like that. Yeah. It was right when there was a huge renaissance of like we d just discovered reverse shift lining and a lot of other new methods of going through the game more consistently. So it was like a more um, friendlier run. So I was like, oh, maybe I can actually try it out. And then I've just been playing it ever since. Got it. Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've seen so many kind of iter iterations, categories, variations of Symphony of the Night. It's been featured in so many GDQs at this point. Uh, you know, Alucard, Richter, any percent, all bosses, solo runs, races. But I believe this is the first time we've seen zero bosses, right? Yeah, there's still tons more categories that haven't been yeah. turned off to. They're just not <laughs> sure. very uh, viewer friendly. Yeah, such it is with uh, Metroidvanias. Yeah. So how did how did zero bosses kind of evolve recently? Um, nobody really liked playing it. It kind of evolved originally as a means of like when the reverse shift line was first found. I think it was a spin off of the pacifist route. Like they were finding new ways of like skipping bosses for the pacifist route, and then. Somewhere along the line, someone realized we don't have to fight any of the bosses yeah. if we don't have, if okay. we don't want to. So in that way, we figured out a way of routing it out, and we just tried it out. Um, Desqual, shout outs to him. He was the one who kind of pioneered all of the setups and the strats for the run that I use today. So if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be able to finish the run really at all. It's, it. it wouldn't be marathon safe if it wasn't for him. So. 
And then as, so I guess this uh, reverse shift line was one of the big kind of events where, where you guys said this, you know, this really might be possible. Yeah. After that point, um, did you guys have to find out additional kind of specific glitches and kind of hone in on Yeah, a handful. Uh, I wasn't really around a lot for that kind of stuff. I kind of just was um, doctored into all of it. I was just kind of like, oh, can you do this? And someone's like, yeah, someone found that out like a while ago. You can go and like all the resources that I've had have been through uh, TurboDog0702, uh, shout outs to him. Uh, Forgone Moose, shout outs to him. Um, even shout outs to, not necessarily for this run, but Talek Zelot. He's done a whole lot for the game, especially in the any percent and all bosses categories. He's a huge help. So shout outs to the whole Soten community. If you want to learn more about the game or how to run it, you can go to speedrun.com slash Soten slash guides, and we have everything you would need to know about starting to run the game. So check that out. Awesome. Do you have a favorite category yourself? Oof. Zero bosses is definitely not my favorite. Yeah. I'm probably never running it again. <laughs> it's so stressful. Um, all bosses is amazing. There's a newer route that we've kind of, um, it's kind of the definitive 100% that we're calling it. It's all bosses, all relics, save Richter. Uh -huh. It kind of spawned from this uh, task run that Forgotten Moose came up with. It's such a cool task. It's done in like 37 minutes on PSX. And like the closest we've gotten on uh, Xbox, which is a much faster, is like, somewhere in the 50, 40 minute realm. And like, just because there's so many options and so many tricks that are so difficult to pull off real time, but we're able to do like variants of it real time. So it's really cool. Yeah. So you've been uh, running this game since 2013. Mm -hmm. It's a really long time, five years. Mm -hmm. um, this game, I feel like the longer running categories like Alucard and uh, Alucard Al Bosses have seen so many iterations. So what has it been like kind of just being there for this total evolution of the game? Um, it's really exciting. Um, there was a lot of evolution very early on when I started at least. Um, that's when we were finding a lot of the newer strats. ROM Scout uh, pretty much dominated all of the Soten categories for the longest mm. time. Uh, up until 2015, I think I started dabbling and getting some of the records. Ben Otten started getting some of the records and stuff like that. Um, and that's just from people finding new strats, it would be like nothing major found, like tricks, but like an individual room, we could find a way to save five or 10 seconds, which nobody really thought of before with more advanced movement, more technical tricks or stuff like that to save some time. So that's been interesting. Um, and that's been real fun to like innovate in that way because I've come up with a couple myself. So that's always fun. Got it. And then I'm going to ask the question that's on everybody's mind, I think. Is Zero Bosses possible on the Saturn version? <sighs> I don't know what's possible on the Saturn version. <laughs> I've never actually played it. It's yeah. awful. <laughs> you only play Fair. it from Maria. That's it. <laughs> so bad. Nice. Um, so we're going to get to some questions from you guys in a few. Just before that, though, uh, I want to introduce my buddy Sent here, who uh, has some prizes to talk about, actually. So, uh, Sent, have you got anything to say? I do. Blecky, what is a prize? <laughs> a miserable pile of donations. You Hopefully don't belong in this interview. <laughs> it was not by my hand that I was given stay in this interview. It was these so-called donors. <laughs> I don't actually remember the rest of that scene. <laughs> you, had to, you had to refresh my memory in the first Oh, so. it's, it's all right, Blackie. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Guys, uh, we have some great runs coming up, and we have some really cool prizes for them, so I just want to take a quick minute to talk about them. Uh, you know, coming up next, we do have Kirby Master doing his uh, really cool run of Fire Emblem, the Sacred uh, Stones. Lots of crazy RNG manipulation and cool stuff going in that, and we have a really nice uh, Ephraim Perler uh, available for uh, that run. Um, I believe it is a, uh, a $10 donation uh, during that run only. Um, and it looks like Ephraim's winning the bid war between him and Erica. So hmm, maybe you might want to donate for that Perler, because otherwise I'm not sure you're going to see too much of him in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and then a little later today, we're going to have Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. And we have some really cool stuff for Metroid. Uh, so first off, we have this uh, really nice acrylic painting from Studio Pen Pen. Um, and that's going to be a uh, $10 donation. Shows, you know, Samus landing right on uh, Zebby's for you. And we have um, this pretty neat here, Metroid Trilogy soundtrack. Uh, it contains, I believe, the original Metroid, uh, Metroid 2, and Super Metroid on um, two discs, four sides. Uh, it's, you know, it's really cool. Again, Proto said it earlier, but uh, vinyl's really making a comeback lately. I, I love it. I got a record player at home. Uh, you know, you just, you don't get that sound quality off of, uh, you know, the, the Betamax tapes or whatever the kids are using these days. I, I don't know. It's all the same. 
And finally, you know, it's, it's actually been up here on our interview table for a really long time, but we have uh, this a wonderful uh, Retrowave Samus uh, portrait from uh, Jace Thor. Uh, I just, I love this. It captures that style of like 80s rock opera, you know, cassette. To, I, don't, I don't know, maybe I'm just super nostalgic for it, but I, I see this and I just think back to like, wow. Man, that, that was cool. I want to go watch a, I want to go watch a Metroid rock opera now. Um, and that's going to be a $25 donation during Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. Um, and as always, guys, remember, we have the 8th generation uh, console bundle, which is running through all the marathon as our grand prize. $150 cumulative throughout the marathon. So, I mean, hey, get your donations in now. Get your donations in later. And sooner or later, hey, you're going to be entered into winning that. And that's it's a pretty, pretty valuable package right there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. Honestly, I'm such, a, I'm such a sucker for video game art, and all this stuff is just so gorgeous. Like, I just, Art, I want you. <laughs> I want you, Art. So get your donations in for sure. Um, we have time for a few questions with uh, Dragon Blitz, so let's get into those. Um, Cray DGAF uh, asks, what is the best Metroidvania-like game from the recent years in your mind? Um, Hollow Knight has probably been my favorite. I have yet to beat it yet, but it is super fun. It's kept a lot of my attention. I got it quite recently. That and Axiom Verge have been the two that I've played the most. Cool, cool, cool. And then just one quick note from uh, Mataluna. Is it true today is your birthday? No. Oh. Well, this meme either will way. Die. This meme will die way, today. Either way, happy birthday, DB. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. That was an awesome run. Uh, really great watch. I'd never seen that before. Really cool stuff. Appreciate it. Thank All right. you, guys. Let's go back to the main stage. Thanks for watching. Howdy, folks. Gindo Keshi hosting here for y'all today. We're going to go straight into our next game, Kirby Master with Fire Emblem 8, The Sacred Stones. We're good? All right. Hi. I'm Kirby Master. We have on the couch here, we can do a quick roll call. I'm Alec K47. I'm S. Grunt. And this is, and this is Terry Ramon. <laughs> Yep, and this is Fire Emblem Sacred Stones. The, this is the eighth game in the full Fire Emblem series, or the second game that was released outside of Japan, and the last game released on the Game Boy Advance. Unfortunately, the route that we take between Ephraim and Erika's, ra Erika's route, I have to cut off the donations like as soon, like very soon. Is, has that been cut off yet? I can give it like one minute, basically, to cut off. I think we can call it. <laughs> okay. I, it's, Unless someone sniped Ephraim's route with the one thousand dollars, we're probably doing Irika's route. Yeah, based on what it, <laughs> what we've been seeing for a while now. Yeah, Erica's up a whole thousand dollars, so pretty sure we're doing that. Yeah. All right then. So I'll give a countdown. Give me a second. Um. Oh, wait. Menuing in Japanese is difficult. Okay. Countdown. Three, two, one. Go. Let's go. So in this category, I will be taking Erica's route. Around a third of the way through the game, I can choose to go with one of the two main characters, Erica, the female protagonist, or her twin sister, Ephraim, the male protagonist. And the route that, the route that I pick heavily changes the early game route anyways, be even, before, even before I pick the route itself, which is why the donation bit war has to be cut off very early. So you do realize that you just called Ephraim Erica's sister, right? Did I? Yeah. Oh, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this game, uh, like you said, it has the two different stories, and then they converge for the last bit. What this means is that he has to plan his route based on which one he's going to be picking. He can't wait until the last second just to pick because things change, and you need to set up for what each character's story has. Yeah, so this chapter you see here, which is chapter one, is the last chapter that's exactly the same between the two routes. After this, everything will be very different. So you just saw him moving the cursor around in kind of a weird way there. That's because the random number generator in this game is deterministic. You can consistently and reliably manipulate the outcomes you're going to get moving the cursor in such a way that the game has to map a, a new path burns a certain number of random numbers in a list that is populated in the same way every time. So 
you can burn a certain number with certain cursor movement and then get the outcome you want. And the rest of this run is very, very heavily dependent on this RNG manipulation. Mm -hmm. and, and you'd think, why is this interesting? You know exactly what's going to happen. Well, things happen. And it's not always what you intend. Uh, the random numbers may be set up, but you have to execute, you have to menu very fast. And there's a lot of interesting things that happen just to get from point A to point B. Because yeah, you can have the random numbers be in your favor all the time, but that doesn't mean it's fast. Mm -hmm. There kind of has, is a limit of how much you can manipulate. Like you can't just manipulate like a critical hit on everything to save time. That's just unrealistic. And there are some, you just can't like go for a perfect level up every time. Which, by the way, we haven't really talked too much about how characters grow with level ups. But every character has a set growth rate per stat, and that growth rate is that character's chance to gain gain a point in that stat when they level up. So we have here the paladin named Seth. Um, could you explain who Seth is for me? OP. <laughs> OP. <clears throat> so Seth is uh, the uh, kind of head retainer knight of the royal family. So he's protecting Erica right now. And in Fire Emblem games, there's kind of a tradition of a really strong early unit that doesn't necessarily grow all that well. Um, not only does he grow well, but, well, he's already very strong, and we're manipulating things so we can get him the levels he wants. That means he is just going to be an absolute beast, in addition to the fact of that he's very powerful in combat, he has good movement because of his horse. And javelins are his weapon of choice, they are 1 to 2 range. That is the key thing there, because if you are attacked by uh, an enemy from two range, and you only have a weapon that hits one range, you won't counterattack. Javelins being one to two can hit either the square next to the character or two squares away. The downside of javelins is that they're pretty inaccurate and also one of the weakest weapons, <clears throat> but Seth is so strong that you usually it usually doesn't matter in a lot of cases. And also you see that uh, little Pegasus there. That is Vanessa. She is also a very important unit. Now, horses don't really fly normally, so the ability to fly and just move over terrain and obstacles without a care is very important to your ability to move around the map. She doesn't have a very high strength growth, but that hardly matters. It just means sometimes you have to manipulate uh, a few more random numbers than you would and take a little bit more time to get her good level ups. But she is going to be um, another one of the main combat units in this run. Yeah, so Vanessa starts very under level and she starts pretty weak, although pretty fast as well. Um, and given that having two really overpowered units, one being a flyer, one being Seth, really makes the game a lot easier. So I'm gonna, <laughs> my goal is to feed Vanessa as much experience as I can without losing much time. And there's gonna be a point later in the run where I want Vanessa to be at level 10 with good stats, so I can promote her, which is a mechanic in most Fire Emblem games where you promote a character from tier one to tier two. That is strength, speed, defense, by the way. Yeah, so those stats, basically, just a quick rundown. You have your health, hit points, that's exactly what you think it is. You have your strength, which is uh, what plays into the ability to deal damage or for uh, magical characters, magic. You have skill, which affects, among other things, your ability to hit and crit. And you have speed, which is your ability to either double attack or not get double attacked by other um, in combat, basically. And then there are the def defenses. There's strength and uh, defense and resistance. <coughs> defense is physical and resistance is magical. And finally, there is luck, which is the last point Seth gained on that level that he just got. Luck factors into most equations, but is not weighted as heavily as the primary stat mm -hmm. for that equation. So generally speaking on level ups, we want to look for strength is by far the most important stat. You need strength to do damage. No amount of RNG manipulation can prevent you from doing zero damage. And speed is also very important, although it's actually not as important as you'd think in a manipulator run for Sacred Stones, because Vanessa and Seth are already really fast, for the most part. 
Although you still want speed, it's just not as important as skill, actually. Skill is a stat that's really important for a manipulated run because every two points of skill gives you one point of crit. And you can't manipulate a crit if you don't have crit, which is really important for some cases. So that is HP, strength, skill, and defense. And if you're wondering, wait, isn't this a game about like military conflict? Why are there zombies, weird eyeball monsters, and skeletons? Well, that's part of the plot of this game. Basically, there's this uh, seal with monsters, and it's kind of being degraded and broken down, and you have to stop that from happening. You know, you got to respect the lore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this chapter, we haven't talked about chapter goals, but there's multiple different chapter goals. For this current chapter, okay, good. For this current chapter, it is a route chapter, which is the general term for a chapter where you're required to defeat every enemy unit on a map. These tend to be the longest chapters in the run, but also usually sometimes the most interesting because it requires you to spread out your units to efficiently take out a lot of units across the map. Because Seth's, one of Seth's main weaknesses is that there's only one of him. <laughs> so, same as Vanessa, there's only one of her. So, we have this Axe user named Garcia. He He's actually a pretty decent unit, pretty solid base stats for the early game. So, he's actually strong enough to 2 hit KO all these skeletons here. Yeah, basically the way to think about it is skeletons are the most similar to your basic human enemies of any of the undead. The zombie types have tons of hit points, but not really any defense. And the eyeball ones are just, uh, they move around, they have a lot of speed. Well, the, and a magic attack. They, they're flyers and use magic, but yep. they're not fast. Which is why Seth using javelins is important, because that lets him counterattack all the eyeballs. <clears throat> because the, um, their magic has one to two range. Mm -hmm. yeah, we don't care about Garcia's level up. He's only a short-term unit. We only really care about level ups for Seth and Vanessa, for the most part, because <clears throat> those are the two long-term units we want to use. Level ups on other characters usually don't matter. And you can see that village there. Uh, not all of the villages have things that are important to the run, but there are a few that do. Uh, that, yeah, visiting that village recruits loot, but a lot of casual players don't know that loot joins you anyways at the end of this chapter, as long as Arthur's alive. So Sometimes it just takes a village. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so this boss is a defeat boss. Ch this chapter is a defeat boss chapter, and I don't turn on animations usually, but I think we're going to have some animations for this because, you know, we're in a marathon, and most people agree that the GB anima Fire Emblem animations are the best in the series. So this strat right here is a strat originated from Rudath. He is a Fire Emblem TASer and also does some LTCs, which is a challenge, abbreviation for a challenge of doing a low turn count. This strat here is courtesy to him, where basically I have Garcia carrying Seth. He's giving Seth to Vanessa here. And now Va Vanessa is able to drop Seth across the village and then be in range of the boss for next turn. So I can kill the boss on turn three. Meanwhile, I'm putting Vanessa kind of in danger here to feed her more experience. But we're gonna watch some animations. I think we're good with that. So, 8% crit. Seems good. If you're a Vanessa fa fan, you're gonna love this run, by the way. <laughs> you are really gonna love this run. And that is a very good level up. The left stats are the stats you wanna look for. They're HP, strength, skill, and speed, which, as we mentioned before, strength, skill, and speed are the three stats that are the most important. Fun fact, I found this RNG seed completely by accident because when I was routing this on an emulator, um, I accidentally killed an extra unit with Garcia, which you saw me do earlier, and then I ended turn, and I thought I made, made a mistake, and then this all happened, and I'm like, wow, what are the chances of this? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how the RNG just lines up perfectly like that. So Vanessa just gained a weapon rank there. That's key for a couple units particularly. It'll come up more later, but weapon experience just... Um, Bye, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, Joshua tries to get a 30% crit on Vanessa with a 50 hit, but Vanessa just gets a 3% crit on him back. That's how you properly crit. <laughs> she shows him how it's done. But um, weapon rank allows you to use more advanced weapons and also has a few other bonuses Ow. that don't really come into play until later. Mm -hmm. As you can see, that weapon is dealing a lot of damage to Vanessa, and that brings into play another mechanic for this game and the Fire Emblem series pretty much as a whole, and that is... Weapons are sometimes effective against other units more than other, uh, some units more than others. So that bow has a damage number, it's might. That number is tripled against flying units. So not the uh, wielder's strength, 
just the weapon's might is tripled. And there are some other weapons that are really powerful later in the game that only get doubled, but we won't see those until a good 45 minutes in. All right, so this is what we call a Gaiden chapter. <clears throat> Gaiden is kind of a term in Fire Emblem games where it's, I think it literally means side story. Yes, it does. They're usually optional side quest chapters in most a lot of Fire Emblem games, but in this case, it's required. So we're, we actually have a chapter where we use Ephraim, the other protagonist of the game. And we have this guy named Orson. He's basically a temporary Seth. Spoiler alert, he betrays you after this chapter. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right. This chapter is really, really boring because you, it's a cease chapter where you have to get Ephraim to the very end. And it's just no real way to speed it up at all. Like, you just have to kill whatever's in the way. And it's just really boring. I think there's a solution to that, though. Yeah, the enemies <laughs> have some a lot of sympathy for me. So they decided to kind of get out of my way to make this a less boring chapter and unequip all their weapons and, f and rescue their friends because they really fight for their friends. So what happened there is called the enemy control glitch. There are a couple ways to activate it, but the, ge the general principle is that you have to reset when an enemy ends their turn on an actor tile. What is an actor tile? Well, in this case, it's the far upper left uh, tile, which becomes one after you open a door or a chest or something like that. Also, later on, you will see him use the torch staff as the, prim uh, as the primary method for activating the glitch. When you use the torch staff, the tile you use it on becomes an actor tile, and you are then able to use uh, the enemy control glitch by re soft resetting on the proper timing. Yeah, so I wanted to point out the, the, these two enemies, this guy's a monk, he uses light magic, and this guy is a soldier, he uses lances, but they decided to try to trade for Vessions, but they're, it's now not going very well. They just don't know what to do now. A yeah. lot of this is actually planned, like them rescuing their friends. That's just so there's less movement. Mm -hmm. uh, enemy movement obviously takes time, so he wants to minimize that. All right, so I bought 10 javelins with 4,000 gold. I'm going to use my remaining 1,000 to buy a torch staff. It's funny how that math works out perfectly, because I actually need all 10 javelins I got. All right, so this is what we call a fog of war, where your, li your, your vision is very limited. Most characters have a vision range of three. You can't see past that. Um, but there is a really helpful tool called the torch staff, which, as Alec mentioned, when you use a torch staff on a tile, you can see around that tile. But when you use that tile, also becomes what we call an actor tile. So in that specific spot, what we're going to see happen is the very first enemy that moves in this chapter is a soldier. He's going to kind of step on that, and then I can just reset there. And enemy control glitch. So this is not strictly necessary, but I'm, I, when I was routing this and I saw the RNG, there was a 1, meaning if you have a crit rate, you're probably going to crit. So I just fed Vanessa a random crit there, and it's funny how that works out perfectly. Just getting her the experience she needs to get to level 10 in time. That's all there is to it. Yeah. And this boss has 39 HP in Japanese version. He has, I think, 26, 27 on English version. Don't ask me why. Yeah, language version differences. There's a lot. They get weird in Fire Emblem. Like, some of them make sense, some of them make absolutely none. That's an Orion's Bolt. That is a promotion item that he is not going to be using. It's for archers. Which, I mean, you only get one archer in the game who is arguably, one of, unfortunately, one of the worst characters in the game. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, featuring chapter number two with no Seth. So this is a cease chapter. This is one of those interesting chapters where you normally have to kind of go all the way around the map and it takes forever because there's a billion, bazillion forests. But if you have Vanessa or Ross as a pirate, because pirates can cross water, then you can skip a lot of this chapter pretty easily. Also, shoutouts to the Lulgers. Yeah, the soldiers there, we call them Lulgers because their stats are notoriously terrible. Like, pretty much, they have, like, zero defense and, like, zero everything besides strength and HP. So, all right, Iroka fans, you donated for this. This is her boss kill of the map, of the game. Hey! <laughs> so you can see she has 15 might with her rapier there. That's an example of th that weapon being super effective or uh, just strong against... Cavalry. Yeah, uh, cavalry units and also armored knights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, the rapier works out really nicely because Erica would not have any crit at all in that boss normally. Oops. I should try to turn off animations. I completely forgot. Oops, we just lost a minute. <laughs> We're going to have some fun here. 
So yeah, he doesn't bring many units just to speed up the turns, and um, now the enemies are all going to be attacking Vanessa. He needs to grind some experience and levels on her, of course, and uh, there's also the, just the fact that you can't really prevent them from attacking without uh, enemy control glitch, and that's not really worth it in this map. Yeah, like, you can enemy control glitch this map technically with the upper left corner tile, but it's, like, not worth it. In fact, it would take no, minutes. It should be I impossible think. because there's no changeable tiles on this map. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's you true. Can't. Never mind. There's no way to enemy control glitch this. I was going to say, it's, it's up there in pretty inaccessible territory anyway. It would take yeah. way too long. But if you can't do it to begin with, then... <laughs> so that um, these archers, you can see they would Ow. do a lot of damage if they hit Vanessa. Um, and there's that ballista, which would also be super effective against flyers. Turn off animations. <laughs> GG. <laughs> yeah, so the animations don't affect the random number generator, fortunately. Uh, but... They obviously do take time, so for most of the combat, they're going to be off. He just wants to show off a few of them, like he said, because they're cool. Yeah, they're cool. Orson betrayed us. Spoiler alert. Okay, so... Archer poem. This chapter is another Seas chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters, actually, with respect to the route, because normally, if you just want to beat the chapter, you would have Seth just carry Erica and just go to the end and just kill everything in a way. It's kind of boring. But we have two other side objectives to make. One, this is a chapter where at the end we want Vanessa to be level 10. She's currently level 7. Now 8, I think. So we still need to keep feeding her more experience. And she's becoming quite powerful. This is probably going to be the best, best Vanessa you're ever going to see, by the way. On the other hand, you also to promote someone, you need their respective promotion item. In Vanessa's cape is the Elysian Whip. And there is a chest with the Elysian Whip in the very upper left corner of the map, which costs around 2 minutes to get, but it already pays itself off over two, the two or three chapters after it. Yeah, the Elysian Whip is uh, the promotion item for flyers in general. Uh, in this case, you get um, you get either a Pegasus Knight or a um, Wyvern Rider, depending on the route you, that you use. And uh, uh, in order to use a promotion item, the unit using it needs to be level 10. So it's not just to make Vanessa stronger that he's leveling her up, uh, because he wouldn't necessarily have to give her as many levels if he didn't have to get her to level 10. Uh, just for strength purposes alone. It's because she needs to be level 10 to use the item. Alright, so yeah, I'm basically having Seth and Vanessa carry Colm and Erica. Colm is a thief that joined us a few chapters ago. Thieves, if they have a lockpick, they can open chests and doors for us. Which is really handy. Especially in the chapter here. Also, here, have a 2% crit. Bye. All right. All right, so these scrubs here are kind of in the way. So I'm just going to kind of cuddle them up and try to avoid as much combat as possible. And you saw him enter the menu there and switch units that way. Sometimes it's faster to switch on the map. Sometimes it's faster to switch through the menu. And... Uh, it, it basically depends on how far you would have to move the cursor. It's kind of interesting to device strats around that, because basically you have something called L switching in this game. So when you press L on a character, then you jump to the next character in the unit list, which is which is set in the chapter. But if you press L on an empty tile, you jump to the first unused unit on the map. You can go backwards in a similar way by pressing R on a character, which opens up their status screen, and then pressing up. So there's a lot of interesting little optimizations you could come up with that. Yeah, uh, that, that's a lot of manipulation I just did. Actually, I'm not sure if I did that right. I'm just going to make sure. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So as you can see, you can actually redo that if you need to, simply because uh, it's basically using the same autosave that you used before, and the actions that you take, uh, you have to actually confirm an action before the changes to the random numbers will be finalized. Yeah, the game doesn't autosave R&D changes for the most part. Seth has to kill the boss with a javelin, which is really difficult because javelins are really weak and inaccurate too. But Seth has to kill the boss at two range because he needs to be able to damage a wall that's in the way of the Elysian Whip on the next turn. And he's barely in range right now. Otherwise, he can just kill the boss in two hits with the Silver Lance without needing a crit. Okay. 
So I can end the chapter now, but again, I need the whip. So I'm gonna spend a few turns grabbing it. So I'm gonna weaken this wall. Seth has barely enough strength to destroy that wall in two hits, by the way. So it works out very nicely. And I need to, Vanessa and Colm also need to survive. They're not exactly very bulky, so they both die in two hits, I think. And two, there's two archers nearby. They both have long bows, which are inter unique bows that can allow you to attack from three range. Meaning, unless you have a longbow yourself, you cannot counterattack them. Very annoying to deal with. But fortunately, they all just miss Vanessa. All right, so break down this wall. Colm is going to drop his iron sword. Important, because there's a knight that's going to attack him, and um, knight beats Colm in the weapon triangle. And if Colm drops his iron sword, the knight has a higher chance of missing. Which never talked about the weapon triangle. No, we didn't. So let's go over that. So there are lances, swords, and axes. Swords have a bit less damage, but they have a higher hit rate. Lances are in the middle, and then axes have the highest damage, lowest hit chance to hit. But they also have uh, different effects on each other. Swords are strong against axes, at which are strong against lances, which are strong against swords. And when you're fighting an enemy that you beat in the weapon triangle, you gain one damage and 20% uh, hit, is it? 15 in 15. this game. Okay, yeah, it varies from one game to another. Um, some of it's 10. Uh, and then they get the same as debuffs. Or vice versa, if you're losing the weapon triangle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Erica's route, you all donated for this. So here you go. This is the third, this is the point of the, of the game where you choose which character to go with. And we choose to go with Erica, because you all donated for her. Which, in my opinion, is a more fun route, so it's okay. All right, so we're gonna see, we're gonna promote Vanessa immediately. Um, a, a general misconception among a lot of casual players is that promoting early is always bad, which is not strictly true, per se, because generally speaking, yes, it's if you are aiming to re have a unit hit level 20 and try to max their stats, yes, it's better to promote at level 20, but in most cases, that's never realistically going to happen without excessive grinding. And especially in a speedrun case where you want to get the direct benefits of a promotion as soon as possible. So right here, Vanessa gained 4 constitution and 2 speed, and because her constitution is typically terrible, she gets weighed down by almost anything, so she actually just effectively gained six speed, basically. It's just ridiculous. Yes, each weapon has a weight value. More powerful weapons have higher weight values. And based on the character's constitution stat, they can lose a certain number of speed points when they're wielding that weapon. So, uh, the fact that Vanessa was just so fast in terms of raw speed was really important before now in her terms of her being able to double things with the javelin instead of the, uh, I believe she starts with the Slim Lance. Yes. And uh, Slim Lance has very low weight, so she's not really weighed down by it. She's able to use her full speed. But with javelins, which you want her using for various utility reasons, uh, she would have been weighed down significantly more. They have 11 weight. She starts with five con, so she loses six speed, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's significant. You can also see another uh, Pegasus Knight there, Tana. She is not really used much for combat, just a little bit. She's primarily used to ferry units around. You saw a couple chapters ago that he flew, uh, used Vanessa to fly Erica to a boss area where he needed to seize a chapter. And he's been doing the same with uh, Seth and other units with a lot of mobility to vary around units. Having two flyers is very, very important in terms of being able to move around the units you need to move around in a few specific chapters. Right. We haven't talked about this actual chapter, but this is a route chapter, so I have to defeat every enemy unit on the map. Vanessa has to kill this boss with a javelin because she needs to counterattack everything that's near her. There's a shaman nearby that attacks her at two range. She activated a skill there called Pierce, even though she would have done 9 damage otherwise. Pierce is a skill that Wyvern Knights learn upon promotion, and the activation rate of Pierce is your level. So Vanessa had a 1% chance of activating Pierce. <laughs> but she had 0 crit on that boss, I think. I don't remember off the top of my head, so she has to get it. No, she didn't have 0 crit. She got a crit anyways. I'm thinking of a different boss. <laughs> but Pierce is a skill that Vanessa's class learns, 
And what it does is it negates enemy defense, which is really relevant at endgame. Yeah, each promoted class, Paladin, Wyvern Knight, Sage, so on, has a unique skill in Not this game. Not all of them, but some of them do. Yeah. So, um, Pierce is actually very important and useful because uh, when you're lining up an, a, even a regular attack against an enemy with a lot of defense and you just negate that, you deal a lot of damage. Okay, so here, my goal is to finish this chapter in three turns, which is pretty absurd because this is a really big map with a lot of enemies to kill on the map. Um, there is one tile. There, there's a lot of four enemies around Seth, but there, it's impossible for all four of them to attack Seth on the same turn, actually. So I actually deploy Arthur, who is a light mage, just to kill one enemy. Right there. Ow. See ya. Arthur works out nicely because he's a mage, so he targets resistance, and physical units have bad resistance. On top of that, light magic tends to have higher crit rates, meaning Arthur has an existing crit rate on that mercenary. So he was able to play his role to kill one unit. Earlier in this chapter, I also had another horse unit, Kyle, to take out a pirate because he actually has a pretty respectable base strength stat. So with a steel sword, he was able to kill a random pirate in two hits. Which yeah. is kind of the cool thing about route chapters, because you just see more character variety in route chapters, even if you just use a random unit just to pick off one, yeah, one enemy unit. Kyle is one of the traditional social knight units. Um, so uh, they don't really get used because they're not needed, but they're used on occasion, mostly for mobility, occasionally for the occasional chip kill. And while uh, the rest of these enemies are finished off, I think it would be a good time for a donation. Yeah, we can squeeze in like one donation. Okay, well how about $250 from Ow. Walt? Indeed, y'all have been doing a great job applying your skills to these runs. Great work. All right, thank you. Chapter 10, this is a cease chapter where you're supposed to kind of go all the way to the bottom and open the gate and then cease the throne after killing like 10 enemies. And there's also a few green units that will join us at the end of this chapter if they survive. Whoa, spoilers. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, good point. Oops. Um, it's featuring the third chapter in a run with no Seth. Yeah, you see that mountain? Who cares about mountains? We're just going to fly over it. Yeah, some layouts are just not insurmountable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Tana there is going to ferry uh, Erica most of the way. And then uh, Vanessa's going to take her and drop her. That's a pretty common technique for uh, fairy strats. Yeah, because when you rescue someone, you cannot drop them on the same turn. You just have someone. If you want to move someone on the same turn, you rescue them. You have to use a second unit to take drop them on the same turn, which is what I did here. That it right there is a sniper. He's in S. He's a pre-promoted archer. Archers tend to be not good in most Fire Emblem games because they can't counterattack at one range. And that's still true for Ines, but he's really useful in a few cases for this run, which you'll see you'll see soon. Meanwhile, we, the boss is in the way, and there's also this jerk who's blocking our path. So I'm going to go ahead and kill the boss with Vanessa first. Vanessa has zero crit. She needs to land a Pierce instead, which is around a 1 or 2% chance. So there's a Pierce animation if you like it. And see ya. And on top of that, she gets a good level, hopefully. Yeah, you're gonna see those three stats a lot. FYI. Uh, specifically the first three of those, yeah, the first strength, three. skill, and speed. Uh, those are the primary offensive stats, so those are the ones that are going to be <laughs> used a lot because if you need your character to dodge, you can usually manipulate it. And this is for you, Tana fans. She gets a crit, and peace out. Alright, this next chapter is a fog of war. It's also a route chapter, so I need to defeat every enemy on the map, but you will see a bit of, tor of the enemy control glitch again. Um, basically, the general gist of this chapter is that you're in a building that kind of winds back and forth, and it's really annoying to navigate. There's also a bunch of enemies in the bottom left corner of the map. And there's a bunch of horse tiles in the way. The problem with Seth is that he's on a horse, a grounded horse, and mounted units, grounded mounted units suffer a three movement penalty through force tiles. Grounded infantry units usually suffer two movement penalty. So that's why I'm going to be using Vanessa to take care of the lower left corner while Seth kills everything in the building. And given that this is a longer route chapter, this will be a good time for a few more donations. Absolutely. And speaking of Seth, uh, $20 from Anonymous. 
I'm really happy to see my first Fire Emblem game getting a run out, so I just had to make my first donation to AGDQ during it. I'll add another dollar on for each level that my main man Seth ends on. I actually don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember off the top I of my head I think it's like either. 14, 15, something like that. You'll, you'll see at the end of, end of the run. <laughs> yeah. Remind me to check his stats before the last chapter. Absolutely. $15 from Old General Crash. Hey, Kirby Master, thank you for showing this awesome run of Fire Emblem 8, which to this day remains one of the best in the series. You could also use Amelia, but Seth is fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the Fire Emblem Reddit community. $50 from the proverbial penguin. First time donator, long time watcher. Had to donate for my favorite Fire Emblem game. Thanks for all the great games and even better stream. Also, Nime for life. All right, coming up is the hardest thing in the game. And I need, I'm gonna need some serious, serious time for this. Yep. FYI, I'm half joking, but enemy control glitch is actually really easy if you know how to set it up. The frame window for it's really wide. I would probably estimate like a third of a second. I've never actually timed it though. But I have a habit of missing this enemy control glitch because I just don't pay attention. So, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the timing cue for this is a little bit different than most other instances of this in the run. Yeah, because usually you have an enemy attacking someone during enemy control glitch, which is a really easy cue to catch. But in this case, that's not going to be the case. So, there we go. I just have to pay attention, and it's easy. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm moving these two units against the wall so Ines can snipe them through the wall. And there's also a door in the bottom right area with like 10 enemies there that's blocked by the door. I'm going to use an enemy that has a door key to open the door early. Those three stats again. Normally, like it that. wouldn't be opened nearly as early. Yeah. And then he's going to move a few other units down faster than they would move themselves and uh, you know, cause them to attack a little bit. More importantly, they're Franker Z's. Franker Z, Franker Z, Franker Z, Franker Z, Franker Z, Franker Z. Alright, so there is a longbow archer. I'm gonna move Mulder here to see the archer so I, Seth can actually kill him because he's a jerk. And I, again, I can't counterattack longbow archers on enemy face, so I need to use a player face to take it out. Okay. And I need to manipulate Seth into getting strength at the minimum next level. It's, of course, it's always important to get strength, but it's especially important here because there's going to be some Franker Z's that will attack Seth on a pillar, and the pillar gives a plus one defense, plus 20 avoid boost. Seth cannot double attack them, surprisingly, because they're very fast. But and, Meaning Seth has to kill them in one hit, but because thanks to the defense boost from the pillar, he doesn't kill them in one hit anymore. But gaining strength on his next level up will give him just enough strength to one-shot these Franker Z's coming up soon. But yeah, there's not too much else to talk about in this chapter. It's just waiting on a bunch of enemies to suicide and kill themselves on Vanessa and Seth. So this is a good time for some more donations. There we go. We're going to see our lovely three stats again. Strength, skill, speed. Got $151 from Anonymous. I never expected to see a Fire Emblem game on GDQ. Some of my favorite old games. $20 from Nebels48. Had to donate during the Fire Emblem run. FE is one of my favorite series, and Sacred Stones is one of my favorite games. Good luck to all the runners, and let's kill cancer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. $150 from Hawkeye40. Wish I wasn't working during the Sacred Stones run. Shout out from Serene's Forest. Donation <laughs> to Runner's Choice. Yeah, that's one of the main Fire Emblem communities on the internet. Mm -hmm. And we have another turn of enemy suiciding, so keep, take it away. <laughs> $150 from Anonymous. Erica is the best. Fire Emblem is one of my favorite series of all times, and I couldn't not donate during it. Hi, Kaz. Hashtag Team Chibi SIRL. $5 from Rikito. Sacred Stones was the first Fire Emblem game I played. Love seeing games broken in half and am not disappointed. Donation to Runner's Choice. Thank you. All right, so this should be the last enemy in the chapter. Next chapter is another really big route chapter. Um, thankfully, not in a fog of war. 
Um, we are also just got Dozla and LaRachel. LaRachel being objectively the best character in the entire series. <laughs> if, if you disagree with me, you're objectively wrong. Um, I don't want to be right. <laughs> 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 Alright, so Dozla is really useful because he is a pre-promoted berserker. Hold on. It's one of those few more involved bases. But yeah, he's a pre promoted Berserker, and Berserkers in this game ha gain a plus 15% crit bonus. They can also walk on peaks, which is very equally important in this chapter. The reason why that's important is because there's a bunch of mountains in this chapter and a bazillion stupid spiders. These spiders are really bulky, and they're also on mountains, which gives them a plus 2 defense boost, plus 40 avoid boost. Yeah, and they move one tile per turn, which makes them even more annoying because it takes forever for them to get off a freaking mountain. So Dozla's role is very important because he's one of my very few units who can go on peaks. The other being Vanessa and Tana, but Tana is in no position to actually take on these spiders because she's really weak at the moment. Another note, note, thing to note is I did a rescue drop. We also got another unit named Tethys. She is what we call a dancer. Dancers allow units to move again. So in this case, I had Tana rescue Seth, refresh Tana's movement so she can drop Seth across the mountain to skip half the map with Seth. Seth crossed an invisible trigger point on his map that triggers a bazillion reinforcements to spawn, and given that there's no way to directly avoid it, and given that this is a route chapter, I want him to spawn as soon as possible so I can take, clean them out immediately. So right there. I'm sure a lot of casuals probably got caught off guard by that, by trying to skip the map. I did, for sure. So you see some Ines kicking butt here. And another unit we got is Sala. He is a pre-promoted sage. He has really respectable base stats, and he can pretty much kill anything he wants for the most part. If, also, any of, if any of you have played... Uh, <laughs> Alright, go ahead. <laughs> if any of you have played uh, the previous game, Fire Emblem 7, Blazing Sword, uh, you may be familiar with Pent. Uh, Sally is kind of like Pent, not quite as good. You could call him Pent Light. Mm -hmm. But he's still really good and really useful. Yeah, so the thing with Sala is that if you saw the Fire Emblem run, my Fire Emblem, Fire Emblem run last year, um, you saw some significant use of the Rescue and Warp staffs, which you get late game, which allow you to warp the faraway units to the staff user and vice versa. Those two staffs require having a B rank and A rank, but Sala only starts with C rank staves, unfortunately, so we're not going to see those staffs used at all in this run because training Sala's staff rank to B rank costs way too much time to do and also waste some of his turns that he could be better spending in a speedrun setting. So it's kind of unfortunate, but this run is still very fast, so. And those gargoyle enemies have uh, pretty high defenses and strength, but they don't really have much resistance at all. So those two that are down by Sale are pretty easy pickings for him. Mm -hmm. And here we go, another level. I think Strength, I've seen that level up, speed. have you? <laughs> I think it's my first time seeing that. Alright, so there's going to be a lot more enemy killing since this is another route chapter. Um, so it's probably another good time for some more donations. Yep. Sounds good to me. $33 from Karma Jolt. Fire Emblem. I hardly knew him. Also, marginally fun fact, the Sacred Stones in this game are the same Sacred Stones from Double Dragon 3, the Sacred Stones. <laughs> Erica's route is nice, but it doesn't give you a chance to recruit Bimmy. Anyway, keep up the great work. This is Karma Jolt, and I'm telling my friends, you're great. Bimmy Lee is best Lee. <laughs> $50 from Cabs. I love Fire Emblem. Makes me feel really smart, like when sending a single person to take out an entire army every battle. Classical tactical maneuver. <laughs> $20 from Ducks Tim. Had to donate during the Fire Emblem run. I love Fire Emblem, and I want to see Cancer get the boot. Good luck, Kirby. By Thank the you. way, I want to see someone beat the one level I can't beat in Super Mario 3D World. $10 from Ninian. I have to donate during the Fire Emblem run because it's my favorite game series, and because not only did Cancer take my grandfather many years ago, but it also just recently took my boyfriend's grandmother. Cancer is a horrible thing, and I hope this donation will help to end it. Good luck to the runner, and may the RNG goddess be with you. Thank you for the donation, and I'm sorry to hear that. $50 from Lady N. 
So many people in my life have been suffering from cancer in some form. Some survived and some did not. This donation is for all of them in the hopes that this disease will finally be cured soon. $10 from Kurth101. Lost both my grandmother and dog to cancer last year, so glad this is going to a good cause. Shout out to the Odd One Fire Emblem community for getting me into the series. Looking forward to this run. There's something interesting to note. Um, there's a unit you can recruit on this chapter called Yuen. He's what we call a training unit, similar to Amelia and Ross. They're kind of like a tier zero unit. Um, they're most Yuen and Amelia are generally considered some of the worst characters because they take way too much effort to raise and aren't don't actually don't grow as well as people think. But Yuen also joins with an energy ring on this, which is a really useful stat booster. Unfortunately, it's actually not really directly useful in the Irika's route, but you do actually use an energy ring you get into Ephraim's route, which is interesting. Yeah, an energy ring uh, raises either strength or magic, depending on which kind of character uses it, by two. Stat, most stat ri uh, raising items raise the relevant stat by two. Mm -hmm. And as energy, given that strength is like one of the most important stats at all, of all time, it's like probably... It's, there's usually only like one per game because it's such an important stat booster for good reason. Okay, so the chapter is almost over. Alright, and we have like three units left, I think. And if this goes right, Vanessa should gain our lovely three golden stats again. Lovely. All right, so the next chapter coming up is an 11 turn defend chapter. And in an Ephraim route speedrun, we actually use Cormag as our main flyer because he has better, more reliable base stats than Vanessa, and he joins at a better time. In Irika's route, he joins significantly later, and it requires waiting like at least seven or eight turns for him to show up on this chapter, which we can actually just end in one turn. So, oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> But unfortunately, so that's why we stick to using Vanessa, because she's around for longer, and it, it, Corm just recruiting Cormac is just stupid in this chapter. Availability is a legitimate factor you have to uh, bear in mind when you're looking at a unit. So we got Garrick. He's a pretty useful one-range unit. He has really good base stats, and it's already level 10, I think. Yes. And we have Ines, who's going to ride this Ballista and kill this fun unit here. Bye, Amelia. <laughs> Angel thumb. <laughs> Angel thumb, indeed. Kirby, how could you? <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. She th she's not going to add much to the run anyways. I can tell so many people are going to be angry at me for that. <laughs> <laughs> that is not part of the route. I routed it in for fun. All right, so Sala is going to Sala is gonna be awesome here. So if you're a Sala fan... Three percent crit. This boss is incredibly bulky. Like he was, he's able to tank a hit, a crit from Sale, which targets resistance too. So killing this boss in one turn is actually really difficult. And it's also very important that he used that specific tome because you can see only a three percent chance. He got five from the tome, so it would have been a zero mm -hmm. because it was less if he had been using his other magic tome. But he will be using that other tome, um, Elfire instead of Thunder quite a bit because he does need to grind some weapon experience on Saleh so that he's able to use an even more powerful tome, Excalibur, later on. Yes, so the Thunder Tome gives Saleh one weapon experience per hit and two weapon experience for a killing blow. So typically speaking, if Saleh 2 KOs an enemy with Thunder, he gains three weapon experience. With Elfire, that is actually doubled. So you, in other words, you gain four weapon experience for a killing blow and two for a hit. But the downside to Elfire is that while it is more powerful and actually more accurate than Thunder, it actually weighs him down a bit, which makes him unable to double certain enemies. Whoa, I always forget to turn off animations. It's all right. So a little bit of ironic timing there. We just got $20 from IC254 who says, Amelia is best girl. You're objectively <laughs> wrong. <laughs> 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 I am also, so don't forget. Okay, good. I was going to say. <laughs> I apologize, not really. <laughs> Getting flashbacks to RPG limit break there. <laughs> yeah, so Salah plays a kind of an important role here because not only do we need races weapon experience, but there's a lot of one to two range enemies on this map. 
And it's all that plays the role of just clearing the path for our mounted units, Seth and Vanessa, to go through. This is a classic Seize Trapper, so what my goal is to eventually have Seth and Vanessa carry Erica and Tethys, the Dancer, to the throne as quickly as I can. So a bit of manipulation here. So this guy here is a thief. You can recruit him by talking to him with the racial, I think, but he's in the way, and he's useless for us, so we're just gonna kill him. He's very fast, so we cannot actually double him. So you have to manipulate a crit with Thunder on him. And that item he just got is rather important. It's not important for the run, but it's very useful otherwise. It's called a member's card, which allows you to visit a secret shop. Which I think there's a secret shop in this map. It's yep. in the green patch to the left of the throne, I think. I don't remember off the top of my head. But, but we're not going to use the secret shop in the speedrun. Yeah, those are uh, places that you can get all sorts of interesting things. And there are speedruns of Fire Emblem games that do use it. But you just don't need it here. Fire Emblem 6. The speedrun for Fire Emblem 6 goes to the secret <laughs> shop to buy boots. Because you can literally buy boots there, which permanently boosts your movement by plus 2. So you have like 15, 14 movement Roy running around <laughs> in the speedrun. It's great. <laughs> I think they realized how stupid it was after that game. So you can't buy boots anywhere after that. Yeah, boots are actually really hard to come by in this game. Even with the post-game content that they added. Yeah, you can get infinite boots in this game. But that requires doing some manipulation with the Lagdo Ruins. It's, there's actually a guide for manipulating that somewhere on GameFAQs where you, where if you do the manipulation properly, you can always spawn an enemy that drops it boots. Swift Souls in this game, but I'm just gonna call them boots because it's a stupid name in my opinion. <laughs> and then you can just get 15 move, everyone. 15 move is the max movement for every character. So it's kind of funny. All right, so this chest is very important. It has the spear, which is gonna be Vanessa's main boss killing weapon towards the end of the run. Because the spear is the third most powerful lance in the game, I think. It's all the silver lance and the Vidofner, which is a legendary lance, are the only lances stronger than the spear. However, the spear is reasonably accurate. It has one to two range, which the other lances do not. Very important. And on top of that, what makes it a good boss killing weapon is the fact that it has plus five crit. It doesn't sound like much, but given that I've been getting a lot of important kills with Sala, getting plus five crit from the Thunder Tome. It's pretty important for a manipulator run. You might even say it's critical. It's a very critical point. But yeah, that just goes into the um, idea of manipulating fast rather than manipulating more. Because if you use the uh, uh, weapon that has a greater chance to hit that will still kill, then you might have to do less RNG burn, and that's just faster. Mm -hmm. Right here, I uh, having Erica and Tethys close together near the throne is really useful because thanks to Tethys being able to refresh Erica, I can effectively have her seize the throne from 10 squares away. She's exactly 10 tiles away and I want to be as far away from the throne as I can while being able to seize it because I'm <coughs> excuse me, that means Seth can kill fewer enemies because you want to avoid killing enemies you don't want to, you don't need to kill. That's why there's two random knights just kind of surviving there, chilling. Alright, so Seth is running out of javelins, so Vanessa's going to give him one. All right, here, have a crit. This crit is actually really annoying to manipulate because as you can see from the stat screen, 42 hit is not very reliable. So even with a 30% crit, the chances of killing this boss is kind of low because Seth also does not double attack this boss since he's very fast. And at this point, Seth's level ups don't really matter anymore at, because he has the stats he needs for most of the rest of the run actually. So it's not really important. It's not vital to him keep improving his stats that much. He has what he needs for the most part. And these are the first two of those uh, weapons that I mentioned earlier that only get their might doubled on something they're super effective against. Mm -hmm. uh, the important one is the Tome, Excalibur. That's going to go on Saleh, and he's going to be able to use it soon, but he can't quite use it at the start of this chapter. Uh, it is strong against flyers and monsters. Uh, it's in some games, not this game. Okay. And, um, yeah, just monsters. That's right. We checked this before the run. Sorry. <laughs> I'm tired. It's I've all right. Just, I've been doing a lot over the there last There is a lot days. to remember in this game, and I would not be surprised if I said something wrong in this game. <laughs> uh, but it also has uh, very high damage, uh, very high might, specifically and uh, a critical rate, so it's easier to manipulate criticals. There's Boots. Uh, it's a random chance based on the character's luck, uh, much more likely, if not guaranteed, depending on the game. It varies uh, for Thieves, but he's able to get that one just by using the uh, RNG seed and uh, Saleh's luck. 
Yeah, um, the chance of finding a hidden item in the desert for sacred stones depends on the main RNG of the game, which is the same RNG I've been manipulating the entire time. So, um, as opposed to with Fire Emblem 6 and 7, the RNG for finding desert items is actually different, works differently. It's independent of the main combat RNG. So what you, you can kind of manipulate having a guaranteed desert item in those two games by resetting, soft resetting the game, resuming chapter, and then opening up a stat screen and or a weapon screen and then just waiting on the tile with a hidden item, and you're guaranteed to find it. There's a list of like which cases that what you do for each mode because it, it's actually different between like Elliewood mode and Hector mode, I think, for whatever reason. I don't know why, <laughs> but in, in Sacred Stone's case, it's just the main RNG where it just burns exactly one random number to calculate do you find this or not. So, all right. So Salah did just hit S rank Anima Tome, meaning he can now use Excalibur soon. And we're going to see him melt a bunch of stuff. And this is a chapter where he kind of wants to join the trinity of OP units with Seth and Vanessa. Unfortunately, he failed the test because he joins too late in the game. But he's still pretty awesome. His survivability is an actual issue because as a mage, he can't, he's rarely dodgy, but he cannot take like more than two hits. And it's really important to keep him as healthy as possible because he's going to be killing the boss in the bottom right corner. The, manipulating a crit on the boss on top of the boss Missing Salah is like almost impossible. Yeah. It's just much easier to just have Salah make sure he can take a hit from the boss and not worry about that. There are two bosses in this chapter and they're both really strong. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, as you said, they're going to be melting a lot of units. So uh, we have time for a few donations. I agree. $10 from Dirk Grayson. Rip Prince Joshua, you monster. <laughs> $40 from Brecken Sky. Yo, Kirby Master. Your FE runs are great, always a highlight of these events. Let's crit cancer together. Can I get a Seth best waifu from the crowd? <laughs> mm. <laughs> no? The crowd wants want to? to? <laughs> I'm not the crowd. I'm not the crowd, so. To. <laughs> $5 from Anonymous. First time viewer of GDQ. Great to see this is going to a good cause. Also, Kirby Master gained a fan. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, that's it. Oh, Ephraim just joined us kind of late. So something to note about this chapter, I forgot if you mentioned, but this is a route chapter. We have to kill everything. There are two units on the bottom of the map. Of the map. They're troubadours, which are staff users, and they're annoying because they don't attack you on enemy phase. So for each troubadour on the map, I need to use a unit's player phase to kill them. And Sal is busy because he has to kill the shaman on the next turn, and Vanessa is going to kill one troubadour, but again, she, there's only one Vanessa. You could say it's a shame about that shaman. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why I'm going to be using a strat to get Tana down here to help pick off the tr second troubadour because she's just barely strong enough to two-hit KO her, which is really nice. Related, Unrelatedly-ish, the boss in the upper left corner, he has what we call an iron ru Okay, it's an iron ruin in Spider-Man 7. I don't remember what it's called in this game, but it's an item that prevents crits, meaning I can't manipulate a crit on him. So I have to just hit him three times because he's just really bulky and there's no way Seth can actually kill him in two hits. So Wait, there, Seth, there, there are things Seth can't do? I, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Not many. But the, here's an interesting version difference, though, which is very relevant. In the Japanese version of this game, Kalich, the, bottom, the boss in the upper left corner, moves, which is good in this case because that means I don't have to go to him. And also, in the English version of the game, he does not move, and he's parked on a freaking fort, which gives him auto recovery, plus two defense, and extra avoid, making killing him even more of a pain in the butt. <laughs> so, one very nice thing about running the Japanese version of the game. Another thing to note, we didn't talk too much about Japanese differences, but the main reason I'm running on the Japanese version of the game, I should have talked about this earlier, but too much to talk about. Um, every time you reset, if you hold a start button, you can jump straight back into battle without having to go through resume chapter or something, and... I need to reset every time I do enemy control glitch. I'm also resetting between most chapters to reset the RNG seat appropriately. In the English version of the game, they started adding that warning health and safety screen. And so trying to do a quick reset does not work. You have to wait a few seconds for that health and warning safety screen or whatever, and then go through the title screen, go through the main menu, and it loses like at least like 10 seconds for every reset. So like the Japanese version is like significantly faster than English just because of that. There are other several differences, like start character growths are a little bit different here and there, and boss stats are different here and there. Usually, enemy stats are stronger in the Japanese version than English. Not always. Oh yeah. Here, have a crit with Arthur. Hey! So yeah, 
Archer's one of those units we're recruiting him just to get one kill. Because there's no unit near this mercenary to, that can actually kill him. And Arthur actually has... Does not suffer any movement penalty on the desert. Mages and Flyers do not suffer any movement penalty. Which is why Seth has left killing the stuff in the top. Because most of those tiles are not desert tiles. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Okay, no, no. I need to do this. So here. Tethys is barely in range to refresh Tana here. And now Tana is going to pick off this last troubadour. And almost everything is dead. So we now just end turn. This is Valter. Well, not yet. See ya. Ah, oh, I forgot to turn on animations. Oh, well. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, he would have wanted it for this specific attack right here. Boom. Bye. Because the uh, Excalibur animation is pretty cool. It's pretty awesome. All right. So that is, this is also the chapter, kind of one of the chapters that where the two routes converge, which is why Ephraim just rejoined us. The next chapter is the chapter where the two routes, from here on out, the maps are shared between every route, both routes, for every chapter. Um, however, this next map coming up is actually really different, despite the same map between the two routes. Yeah, you start in a completely different area for each character, and that definitely benefits Erica for at least, uh, this speed running purpose. Yeah, it's just better all, all around. Like, for reference, in Erica's route, you four turn this map. In Ephraim's route, you six turn it, which is a massive difference. And not only that, the turns are longer in Ephraim's because you have to fight your way through a significantly larger portion of the map than you do as Erica. Mm -hmm. She can get to the uh, throne room pretty quickly, and You'll also notice him placing his units in a pretty suspic uh, specific positioning here in a few moments. Uh, one of the things that can cause reinforcements or enemies to move is just going beyond a certain line. So you don't want to be like Yosemite Sam and just cross the line. Do it when you're ready. In this case, he's going to cross it in such a way that he's going to be able to set it up so that his characters will be kind of in the sweet spot that all the enemies will move to him but they won't be able to reach him and then he'll just be able to finish off the chapter basically yeah for reference Nephrim's route you start in this position and you like go all the way around here and it's just terrible so like this chapter is actually one of my favorite chapters like in both routes in the speedrun just because the strategy just flows really well and you have some neat little rescue chains as well And I definitely want to give a shout out to um, a lot of the people who worked on the speedrun, especially Beacon and Rudath and Gwimpage, who really contributed a lot to the community and the route as well, and a lot of ideas. In fact, a lot of the route you see is based off of Beacon's old TAS of the game. There's also some stuff I took from, some ideas I took just from other runners, DXD, Burton, etc. And just, just a lot of ideas that were put together as a community. And even though I was the person who like put this route together in one go, a lot, a lot of the strategies you see here are thanks to all the names I mentioned. Oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> yeah, no, no, this isn't in the sweet spot that Alec mentioned. No one attacked besides their purge homes, purge users. Yeah, and those are ranged uh, attack <laughs> of, uh, I believe it's three to ten. Three to ten. Yeah, so. Uh, it was pretty important that they missed because they would have one-shotted either Tethys or uh, Erica at this point. Yeah, I accidentally found his RNGC when routing. I think PX was in my stream when I streamed this, and he, I was like, wow, this worked perfectly. All right, don't need to burn any more random numbers. <laughs> I love it when that happens. All right, so this is kind of the point in the game where you're asked if you want to promote Erica or Ephraim. We're not going to because it wastes a lot of time. So we get their respective promotion items instead. On top of that, we're going to get their legendary weapons. I don't know how you pronounce them. Siege Lind, Siege uh, Mund, or whatever? Uh, Siege Mund, the spear for uh, Ephraim, and then uh, the sword, Siege Lind, uh, for Erika. Yeah, both very important weapons, because they are the only legendary weapons in the game that don't require having S rank. But on the downside, downside, only Ephraim and Erika, Erika can use them. Which is really nice, because you don't even need to be promoted to use them. They can just use their weapons right off the bat. So given that the two lords are really underleveled and weak at this point, they can contribute quite a bit in a chapter coming up soon, which will become relevant. 
But this chapter is a kill the boss chapter, and it's a pretty straightforward chapter and self-explanatory, so we can take it off with a few donations. Three hundred dollars from wow. Husker. I've always been a fan of AGDQ, and this year I've decided to step up and donate. My mom was recently diagnosed with cancer, and I want to do my part and make her proud by helping prevent cancer for others in the world. A huge thanks to the staff, runners, and fans that make this whole event possible. Together, we can make a difference. I think we have time for one more. Sure. $10 from Hikari Inu 124 <laughs> Greetings from Silver Spring, Maryland. I want to donate during the FE8 run and give a warm shout out to my home on the internet, the Hitbox Dimension over on Discord. Hi, Kirby Master, and good luck on the run. Thank I watched you. you root this game with Samus Returns and love seeing you play the games I love. Keep up the good work, all. Putting this toward the suitless Metroid run. P.S. Today is my birthday, so here is some birthday money to spread the love. Thank you very much, and happy birthday. All right, this chapter is a really cool route chapter. Some people don't like it. I like it a lot from a speedrunning <laughs> standpoint because it's one of those chapters where it is a route chapter, but it's a really terror phase oriented route chapter, which is really interesting. You wouldn't think that. That's because in this chapter, there's a bazillion eggs you have to destroy that are immobile, and they don't attack you until they hatch, which at that point, you don't want that to happen. And the game really rewards you for going fast and destroying these eggs because you get a lot of experience for every egg you just defeat. Exactly 50, no matter what level you are. No, the game just wants to egg you on, clearly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, e exactly 50, is that what you said, Kirby? Yes, yep. exactly 50. Anyway, um, he's going to be using a fair number of different units just to uh, finish these eggs off quickly, including one he got in the last chapter, Vanessa's sister, Cyrene, the third Pegasus. Uh, probably wondering why her sister's wear, uh, riding a wyvern instead of a, a Pegasus, but, you know, whatever. Well, I'm sure we'll see that in a few minutes. We'll see that right away, anyway. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that uh, some of these eggs are gaining HP, uh, kind of like incubating. That's the timer, so to speak. Oh. And also... They become actor tiles when yes. you kill one Egg of them. tiles are actor tiles in this game. A lot of people kind of think that you can activate enemy control glitch off of like any enemy, any tile. Wrongly. That's because like you can activate enemy control glitch off of like one fourth of the tiles on this map. Because every egg tile is an actor tile. And every one of those fire trap tiles is also an actor tile. This chapter is pretty much um, actor tile heaven. <laughs> so yeah. it's really easy to activate on accident. And what he was doing there was uh, removing a petrify uh, skill from a Medusa enemy that has additional range, so he wouldn't be able to counterattack the Medusa, and mm -hmm. that's basically it. Yeah, I also moved a random enemy on the far right side. Uh, that's to make sure the enemy attacks Seth later instead of Sala. Um, this is the part of the point in the game where I really don't want to avoid level ups as much as possible. So I mentioned that eggs give you 50 experience. That's bad in the speedrun, because I don't want experience at this point. Vanessa and Seth have all the stats they need. So kind of routing out this chapter comes down to how can you balance out the number of characters and minimize level ups at, at the same time. And it kind of became a really interesting puzzle to piece that together. Because like, the more units you use, the less, fewer level ups you'll see because you're spreading the experience out more. But that's more units you're moving per turn. But on the other hand, if you have too few units, you're getting more level ups. So what you see here, it was the kind of sweet spot I was able to find. Like for example, I think I tried out a strat where I added a nest to help take out an egg. But that actually turned out to be only like two seconds slower than what you see now. So it's really close and really fun and difficult to piece that together. I mean, you can't go fast without breaking a few eggs. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to be dropping FM and Irica soon, actually. And as I mentioned before, they can use their legendary weapons. Even though their stats kind of suck right now, the weapons are so good that they can just one-shot almost any monster. As long as they don't miss. So like, if you're an Ephraim fan, Ephraim's gonna get a kill on this map. Right, right here. I think if you scramble, you can uh, fit in a donation, or maybe even two. You can, hey, two or three will work. Oh, quit egging them on. <laughs> yes. $20.18 from Poochie.exe. Shout out to the adorable Terrier Mon on the couch. Best of luck to Kirby Masta, and may the RNG be ever in your favor. I mean, if you know the list, sure, why not? Please put this toward Terrier Mon's choice. 
Can we assume that to be my choice? Because the Terrian wants mine. <laughs> I'd say so. $10 from Smuckers. First time donating to this wonderful event. This game got me through a lot of car rides as a kid. I spent an entire summer getting through Lagdo Ruins. Keep on keeping on. Hashtag Cormag hype. If you wanted Cormag, you would have wanted Ephraim route, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> Either way, seems like this is Smucker's jam. Wait, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, keep going. $60 from Crispy191. Hey guys, always happy to see a Fire Emblem game getting totally broken. It's amazing how much work goes into a run like this. Love the event. Keep up the good work. Put my money toward the next bonus run. $20.18 from Mochiko88. Excited to see the Fire Emblem in GDQ once again. My girlfriend introduced me to GDQ last year, and it was our first hangout back when we were getting to know each other as friends. Can't believe it's been a year now. Got to donate during one of my favorite franchises, of course, and Sacred Stones is excellent. Let's kick Cancer's butt. One more quick one. Sure. $10 from Anonymous. This $10 is donated in loving memory of Joshua, Amelia, and Rennick. May their sacrifice be remembered. Uh, those aren't the only deaths in the run. And with that, this chapter is over easy. It was an excellent chapter. <laughs> yeah, why don't we hear more applause for these puns? Come on. <laughs> Too many boos. <laughs> all right, this is the best chapter in all Fire Emblem speedrunning. I am, I am right. You are all going to be wrong if you disagree with me. Why? Because we are going to see... The Rachel! Yes! Wow, this crowd's pretty quiet. I'm very sad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on a serious note, the Rachel is actually really useful here because she has more movement than my other staff users. I could technically swap Solid or Molder to a closer tile, but it takes more time than just using the Rachel instead. And she comes with her own torch staff, which is really convenient. So what you're saying is you're well staffed. <laughs> yes. That one burned. <laughs> that one burned. <laughs> All right, so this is a very long defense chapter, but... Well, fortunately, we can just, you know, torch their formations and run. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm, do I'm doing a bit of a rescue chain on the boss. Yeah, rescue chaining the boss is kind of cool. Because the boss is normally in the very bottom left corner, but I used some gen generals in the fog and moved some enemies out of the way, so I can now just kill the boss right now, and that will end the chapter early. And, fortune, and conveniently enough, I don't need to burn any random numbers to get the crit. So, yeah. All right, so I'm going to be getting a bunch of items here. I want to make sure. Hardest part of menuing. Good. <laughs> Do not drop Erica's sword. Good. <laughs> I, have a, I have a habit of just mashing A3 here, because in every frame drop, you just mash A instead. <laughs> Very easy to mix them up. All right, so this is the biggest map in a run and a pretty massive Seas chapter, but it's going to be pretty kind of self-explanatory. Uh, the first thing to note is what I want to do is on, during enemy phase, I want there to be no grounded units at all. That means that, no, and that means that enemies that can only reach grounded units, not p units on like peaks or whatever, will not move at all, which saves a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Cyrene, our Falco Knight, Rescue Tethys and just kind of camp out on his peak. And After then, all, who doesn't love camping in the mountains? I know. <laughs> and then Vanessa camps on his thicket, which grounded units cannot cross. So only mo most of the enemies that move. Hmm. Is that supposed to happen? I don't remember. We'll see. I don't remember if that's supposed to happen. But one of the other things that he's doing is he actually wants to have a fair amount of damage. That yeah, is not that, supposed that's supposed to happen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he, he does want a fair amount of damage on Vanessa, but not that much mm -hmm. on that turn. I know what I did wrong. I, I forgot to do a burn with Cyrene. Okay. So I was hoping this run would be a reset. Let's run with no major resets, but... You know, uh, no, you know, no unintended resets, rather. Yeah, but it happens. All right, so... So here's what I forgot to do. That. Very easy to forget. But uh, like I was saying, he does want Vanessa to take some damage. Part of the way the AI prioritizes its targets is related to 
how much health a character has. So if they're about to die, if they're in critic really low HP, they're more likely to be targeted. Um, that's important because you're going to have a really easy to kill Erica just kind of sitting out in the open, but she's not going to get attacked nearly as much because Vanessa is going to be at such low HP. And it's much easier to manipulate Vanessa to dodge than Erica just because she has such higher stats. Specifically, uh, speed being the main one. All right, fun fact. Gorgons can fly in the Japanese version. They cannot in the English version. I believe the Japanese version came out first, so they probably realized when localizing, wow, Gorgons really suck. Let's nerf them a bit so they don't fly in the English version. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. All right, so we definitely have time for a few more donations before the end of the run, so take it away. $50 from Easy Escape. Enjoying the Sacred Stones run so far. Keep it up, Kirby Master. Donation goes to Runny's Choice. Thank you. And another $50 from Vice. Donating because Kirby Master spoke the undeniable truth about La Rachel being the best character in Fire Emblem. Yes! Always enjoy seeing his Effie runs. $50 again. This one from Nello. Just had to drop a donation during Fire Emblem, which is one of my favorite games. Lost my dad last year to cancer, so hope this helps people in the future. Big shout out to my girlfriend who introduced me to AGDQ last year. Love you, cat. Oh, and donation goes to Runner's Choice. $100 from Space Drake 83 Donating for a completely mad run of my favorite Fire Emblem game. Great job, Kirby Master and crew, and let's conquer cancer. Also, Vanessa and Heroes win, Nintendo. Co-op. $20 from Anonymous. Thanks for speedrunning my favorite FE game. Mir is best girl. Shout out to Fire Emblem General. This is officially a co-op world record. <laughs> Thank you, Asquan, for contributing. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, just smashing the start of it. <laughs> All right, so this chapter, you can actually clear this in two turns pretty quickly, but I'm actually burning a turn intentionally here to wait for a bunch of skeletons to move out of the way. Otherwise, I, they, I'll attack like eight extra skeletons on turn two, and well, actually more than four, and that's actually just slower. And I mean, what good run doesn't have a few skeletons in its closet? I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is a defeat boss chapter, and there is a random skeleton in the way of the boss, so Seth is going to snipe that skeleton, and then Vanessa will get the killing blow on the boss. We mentioned that Vanessa has a skill called Pierce, which negates enemy defense. This is where it's very relevant. I need to manipulate a 12% crit, 12% Pierce at the same time on the boss in order to kill him in one hit. Oh, Tana fans, I'm sorry, she's dead. No. That is actually very important. She doesn't need to die, per se, but I need someone to lure this jerk over, or else this jerk will go here to attack Vanessa, and then Seth will just be blocked. So I, I need a lure to get that skeleton out of the way. Uh, is that supposed to be? That's this way. No, no, no worries, just mixing up Ephraim and Erica's route. Just, make, just making sure. Okay, longest burn in a run. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. By the way, that is nothing compared to the burns you have to do in Fire Emblem Six. <laughs> there are cases where you do like up to twenty burns. All right, bye, Lion. All right, how many Ephraim fans are in the audience? You, I, I, I want to hear as many cheers as you want. In fact, if there's enough cheers for Ephraim. I, I got a present for you. I want to hear from the audience. Enough Ephraim round? Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, wait. Actually, I forgot how to do this. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. There we go. So normally, I would use the Dofner to kill this boss in one hit with doing 162 damage. I'm using the spear instead because I feel like it. Rest in peace, Vanessa. <laughs> you see what you did, audience? You killed Vanessa. Good job, Vanessa. audience. It's all your fault. All right, let's have Seth have a go. <laughs> you chose this part. I mean, what can Seth do, right? If yeah. anyone should be able to like, look damage at that crit. boss. He's going to crit the boss. Nope. <laughs> Ow. What level was Seth before he died? Oh, good point. Good question. Yeah, <laughs> we can check that let's now. Let's check that now. Well, Seth's not dead, fortunately. 14. So 14. Yeah, those are his stats right now. All right. One last dance for the run. All 
All right, this is for you, Efren fans. Poke. <laughs> there we go. All right, time will be coming up soon. It's on the save. It's on the save, so I'll let you know. And time. <laughs> yep, that's Sacred Stones in one hour 16. My record, my record with Arakus Rod's 106, I think, so given I was messing around on stuff a lot, this was a really good run. Pretty happy with it. Before I cut, I want to give a shout out to the Serenz Force and the R Fire Emblem community. There's been a lot of support, and it's also kind of how I got into a lot of being a fan of Fire Emblem as a whole. And I definitely want to give a shout out to especially Gwimpage, who's been probably my closest pal with respect to Fire Emblem and helped a lot supporting me and such. There's also a lot of other members of the Fire Emblem community. TR143, Legrand Grand, DX Steve, um, I really hope I don't forget anyone, Beacon 12, all people who really helped support me in the Fire Emblem speedrunning community. We're pretty small, but we get along pretty well for the most part, and we pretty support each other for the most part. So thank you very much for the community, and thanks everyone for enjoying this run. Next will be Metroid Prime 3 Corruption. And thank you so much, Kirby, for that fantastic run.